I want you to say always in 1934. 1934. Okay. Okay. So I want you to first tell me kind of how the depression affected your family. What was it like mm -hmm. to live in Los Angeles in 1934? Um, well, in 1934, I was a uh, student at UCLA finishing my sophomore year and uh, having to uh, elect a major at that time. Uh, the depression was something that we learned about reading the newspapers and, uh, you know, seeing people selling apples on the corner. But what about you personally? Mm -hmm. I mean, was it, was it hard times for your family? Well, it was always hard times for our family, so it didn't make too much difference. We uh, owned a uh, fruit and vegetable stand, so we had enough to eat. And when uh, we sold that, then we grew vegetables in our backyard. But uh, I don't recall it being any harder or, or easier. Oh, I'll tell you what. Take two. Okay. Can you tell me um, how you first heard about Upton Sinclair? Yes. I first um, uh, was made conscious of him from those billboards in Barnesville okay, Park. Okay, let's start again. That's okay. Instead of saying him, yes. you say Upton Oh, Sinclair. all right, Sorry. fine. All right. Start again. All right, fine. Just kind of put yourself, talk with, in, you know, it's yeah. enthusiasm. All right. Okay. Okay. You have a nice laugh, and you don't have to be all so right. serious. Fine. Um, yeah. Start. Uh -huh. uh, I remember Upton Sinclair from having read about him and re having read his messages on those billboards that surrounded Barnesville Park in Hollywood, across the street from the Los Feliz Elementary School, where I had attended school uh, during the grade years. Um, I also read about him in the political science classes that I took at UCLA and became aware of, the, of what he stood for in discussions with fellow students and in reading that I did. Uh, for classes. Okay, let's just go back to Barnesville Park. If I was walking, in, in, if I was in 1934 and walking up to Barnesville Park, what would I see? Tell me, like, were there a lot of signs? Tell me, describe to me a little oh, bit. Oh, the, there were signs. Uh, Sorry, just, oh, all right. You were, I was talking when you were talking. Okay. okay. Uh, I um, remember Barnesville Park as a place that we uh, called Olive Hill. It was across the street from the school that I first uh, attended kindergarten through the sixth grade. And um, it was a favorite place for uh, pupils who were allowed to cross the street. Frank Lloyd Wright had built some homes there. We were aware of that. There were uh, places to play, playgrounds, uh, on Olive Hill, and uh, it was a place that we were quite aware of all through grade school. In the um, second year when uh, I was at UCLA, uh, since we lived in Hollywood not too far from Barnsdale Park, it wasn't called Barnsdale Park then, it was simply Olive Hill, and uh, these um, Billboards sprouted all the way around. It was quite spectacular. You couldn't help. I remember spending time reading each one and going from one to another and was quite uh, impressed by it because we were now studying about what Upton Sinclair stood for. And tell me, what, did the sign, what kind of things did the sign say? Well, EPIC stood for End Poverty in California. And uh, although... Uh, in our family, I, we didn't know we were poor. I guess we were on, by any measure, but we had enough to eat and we had a roof over our heads. But uh, we always, all of us worked in the store that my parents uh, owned and ran. So that uh, the idea that uh, we could improve our economic lot uh, somehow or another 
came to life as we read what uh, Upton Sinclair was promising us. He uh, stood for change that uh, as you went to school and learned what democracy was all about, he, uh, he was like a shining light. Tell me a little bit more about Upton Sinclair, what you, what you thought about him and what he represented. Uh, just to, you know, again, help me understand if I wasn't around then. You know, was, was it something totally new? Was he just one of a number of other people who were outspoken at that time? I, uh, I don't remember if he was that different. Uh, you know, we were, uh, uh, we were also bombarded with signs that said, Free Tom Mooney, you know, uh, in that, uh, on those same billboards. I later learned that uh, the lady who owned that hill was the heiress to the um, can, what is the Anaconda Copper Company, and uh, she apparently had uh, these social concerns that uh, I think were pretty much expressed by Upton Sinclair in the campaign that he was uh, uh, conducting in in that particular year. Uh, I thought it was very hopeful because it meant change, and and there were lots of things about uh, California and life as we knew it that uh, uh, weren't totally satisfactory. Uh, if you came from uh, where I came from at that time. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what, you know, you, you started to say, what are some of the things that need to be changed? You told me before, well, you came from the wrong side of tracks and... Well, in, 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 in that sense, yes. <laughs> um, you could not be uh, a person born of oriental extraction, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or whatever, and live in California during the 20s and the 30s and know that the laws uh, governing uh, us were not f uh, equal. Uh, my parents, for example, under the California Alien Land Law, could not own a home, so we were forever condemned to be renters. Uh, they, uh, if any one of us in the family desired to be uh, a doctor or a lawyer or enter any of the professions, um, we could, but my parents could not because they were what they at that time called aliens ineligible to American citizenship. And historically, California had a record of anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese um, laws that had been successfully, I think, uh, passed through the conflicts in organized labor, uh, beside the very elementary things of housing and uh, work, I think that um, the idea that there were laws that prevented intermarriage, not that any of us, you know, contemplated that, but the, it seemed to me that there was an inequity there. The more that you studied the Constitution of the United States and American history, and you realize that uh, the democratic principles upon which this republic was based really were a goal and had not yet been achieved. And so you, if you learn this in political science classes at UCLA, then you uh, accept the fact that here comes someone who is not establishment, but who <laughs> says, let's change some of these things. And Upton Sinclair, I think, appealed to me, and I think all through the years I've remembered him in, in that light. Okay, did you stop this okay. um, what? I asked you again, you? actually, to talk about some yes. of the discrimination and, mm -hmm. and difficulties that you felt and how mm -hmm. you were looking for somebody that could represent change. I, uh, uh, I remember Upton Sinclair as a... Um, political candidate who, um, to me, held out hope for change in some of the things that uh, I had become aware of in our society that were not equitable. So I welcomed his candidacy, mm -hmm. I think. Again, let's try this. You, you, made, you, you did too much of a summary. You could expect oh, a little I, bit more I see. about oh, how yeah. it affected you, you know, mm -hmm. of, of, oh, of, yes. of, of what you could not, or could or couldn't do, and how. So we understand oh, uh -huh. personally, you know, we remember how 
We sometimes forget what it was like. We, you know, well, uh, for example, we always lived in a rented house, and my friends at school lived in homes that their parents owned. And when I raised that question of my own parents, they said that the laws forbid them from owning a home. And so in a school, especially when you got to college, or in high school when you attended civics classes, and you read the Constitution, and you looked for anything in the basic laws of the land that said, why should my parents not be able to own land uh, when, uh, or a home when uh, my friends could, uh, you found the answer in uh, such legislation as the California Alien Land Law. And so when you become aware of that, even as a teenager and a student at college, then when someone like Upton Sinclair comes along and says, well, I will end poverty in California, but I also will uh, bring about an improvement in a lot of uh, these citizens, that appealed to me. Okay, so yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Change our, our... Since we ran out of film right at the end of what we, you were saying, I need yes. to say it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but tell me again, mm -hmm. like, what did Sinclair represent to you? And you, when you started listening, you, 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 you know, heard, you read some of the literature, you saw the signs, right? Yes. Was it... Did you feel excitement? Did you feel like that there was, you know, the possibility of some real change? I don't think I felt excitement so much as a sense of relief at last something is going to, is possible. I think that uh, uh, in, in our family, my father had taught us not to expect too much in this country. I don't think he ever wanted to stay here. He felt that uh, there was no future for anyone except a person of, of Caucasian background because this was, as he said, a white man's country. And uh, the belief that any real substantive change would take place in the laws that would give equal opportunity to people of Japanese descent was something that he had long since given up on. And so when Upton Sinclair's you know, promises of change and improvement for the underprivileged came along. Um, I accepted that as great hope and something I could use to argue my father uh, about. But uh, uh, a, uh, the enthusiasm that would come with the kind of dedication that people who believe in that, that wasn't yet a part of what uh, I expected. Uh, experience at that time. It, that came later when war mm -hmm. came about, and you had to make a choice. But I think Sinclair was a, uh, a what is it, an introduction to a period of hope. Great. Um, uh, you said that um, I mean, how did you, you knew about him through, mostly through the signs of Barnesville Park, or did you read? Oh, I did a lot of reading, and I used to read everything in sight. Uh, when I uh, worked in the fruit stand for my parents, you know, our customers would give us uh, discarded books and a lot of these paperback, you know, popular mechanics and Western stories and, uh, and newspapers, because we wrapped vegetables in newspapers. But the magazines I always put aside, and I read all of them, and we went to the library. But, uh, and I read newspapers. We had six, seven daily newspapers in this city. And you read about, uh, I began to clip things about Upton Sinclair, and I also, uh, I, I think, uh, discussed with friends, but the uh, introduction to it came from those signboards. I remember those very vividly. Okay. So you need to tell me once again about seeing the signs because there was a mm -hmm. real problem. Oh, sure. So tell me again <laughs> about right. Olive well, Hill. Hey, Olive Hill, right. Uh, um, all right. <clears throat> okay. 
Well, well, what today in Los Angeles is known as Barnesville no, no, Park. No, no, can't start. You, you have to. Oh, I see. All right. In, 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 in 1934, it was Olive Hill, as far as I was concerned. And I had gone to grade school from kindergarten through the sixth grade at Los Feliz Elementary School on Hollywood Boulevard uh, between New Hampshire and Vermont. And uh, Olive Hill across the street extended. Um, Oh, many blocks from Vermont all the way to Edgemont, uh, and then south to Sunset Boulevard, and then again east to Vermont, and up. It was a tremendously large from uh, plot of land, and uh, I think I did sense uh, a great deal of, of uh, what is it? Not only surprise but delight when I read the the signboards. As set around that entire uh, Olive Hill, um, advertising Upton Sinclair's candidacy to end poverty in California. And I remember that very vividly as one of the things about um, Hollywood where I grew up. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. so these, these signs are surrounding all, the whole area? Right? Yes. How many signs do you think there were? 20? I, oh, no, there must have been much, many more than 20. I, I I don't know. All I remember is that they, they were there and you read them and people um, couldn't help but see them. Okay. And I can't remember whether Free Tom Mooney was before or after, but th those lasted much longer. Mm -hmm. It was like one big block long. Yeah, yeah, over. right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. Um, can, um, what did the... Uh, you, you had a good friend that was, you know, the son of, of one of the editors of the L.A. Times. Right. Um, what did the L.A. Times represent at that point to you? And did you ever have disagree? you know, did you? Well, the Los Angeles Times was a very stodgy, staid uh, newspaper that uh, probably uh, represented in a very dignified way what the establishment stood for. This was a white man's country. It was uh, uh, the uh, feeling toward people, you know, who were from the from Asia, uh, was not expressed as vocally uh, or as I think obviously as in the William Randolph Hearst newspaper, the Herald and the Examiner. The expression "yellow peril" appeared less often in the Times than it did in the Examiner or the Herald. And the people who wrote in the cartoons that appeared, too, were not as uh, openly racist, as we would call it um, uh, today. But uh, the Times was not the most influential newspaper, as I recall, in those years. The uh, Hearst papers were more, and I believe they had a bigger circulation. Did you read the book, ever read the book, The Jungle, someplace? The which one? The Jungle. Did you ever read oh, it? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. I certainly did. That's that, um, I, uh... Was that the first time you ever heard about Upton Sinclair, was reading that Oh, book no, book? no, no. Uh, that was, that came in the course of, uh, some poli-sci classes at UCLA. Mm -hmm. Okay, um... Uh... You had said um, in school that you used to write, have discussions and write papers about the campaign. Do you remember at all any of the kinds of discussions you had with other students? What the papers well, may have been? Um, I don't remember too much in detail, except that it seemed to me our, um, the people that I went to school with were evenly divided between, you know, the feeling uh, that California's future was in the hands of, was in good hands, that the Republican Party was providing the kind of leadership that we needed. And uh, I rode to UCLA with two uh, friends who were neighbors. We were uh, classmates through grade school, junior high school, high school, and in college together. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, my views generally were left of center, and theirs were in the middle or to the right of center. That they felt uh, one whose father was the political 
editor for the Los Angeles Times, felt that the stability and the growth of the uh, California government rested firmly in the hands of the Republican Party. And I regarded myself as a prospective Democratic Party member. Okay. Um, did you ever receive any anti-Sinclair literature? Did you see any of that? Oh, I'm sure I did. I uh, have not saved any of it, and I don't remember much of it. Uh, I think at that time you had kind of a closed mind against the opposition, <laughs> so I, um, I was a reader in political science for several professors at UCLA, and I know that uh, I tutored some football players at the Sigma Alpha Epsilon House, and I used to delight in the fact, since they weren't very bright or studious in the course that I read for, mm -hmm. I used to slip in Sinclair propaganda in <laughs> some of the <laughs> lessons that I <laughs> corrected for them. When, when mm. your parents moved to California, did they think of it as being a, it was just, by many people thought of California as kind of a land of opportunity, a place where more mm -hmm. things were possible. Was that ever a feeling in your family? If they did, I never heard it. No, they just moved here because it was a thing to do. Yes. And they had run out of work up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no slate was marked for this next stake. You can just roll out. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw someone? Oh, I see. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, All right. This is take six. Uh, audio only. Uh, wild track. Okay. So tell me about the newsreels that you saw. Um. I used to go to all of the cowboy western movies, you know, like Covered Wagon. I, this was in the uh, this was in the twenties as well as the thirties, and um, that was our chief form of recreation. So newsreels, you know, Fox Movie Tone News, I think that was uh, one. Uh, there were a number of them that they usually. Uh, they were like a preface to a book, you know. They, they showed those first, and then you saw the, the main feature. And um, I remember in the um, 1934, when Upton Sinclair was pictured as a menace to uh, stability and uh, law and order in our society. And the fact is that if you voted for him or if you campaigned for him, he was um, going to bring in chaos, and the unemployed would flood California. That um, he was everything short of a Bolshevik or a communist. That this is what Upton Sinclair and his so-called campaign to end poverty in California stood for. Then, when we did see them, I was—it could very well have been because I found myself suddenly a minority of uh, people around there were cheering and applauding, and I thought that they had turned up the sound for that portion. And I'm in, in view of what I think uh, we do with television these days. Commercials get turned up more. I think that's what they did in those uh, movies. And what do you think about those? I didn't care for them particularly. I was wish that they would get over with them as quickly as possible, but you ran into them everywhere. And you knew that uh, someone was able to pay for those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay. Great. All right. Can I run some tone? Yes. Yeah. Okay, now what we're doing is, well, you've been, mm -hmm. I've been to the janitor's mm -hmm. uh, room tone. All right, uh, we're just going to yeah. call this room tone in, uh, oh, I, I in Westwood. Okay, everybody get comfortable for 30 seconds, okay. and, and we're rolling. Wait, second oh. six, yeah. Marker. Okay, let's start off by, um, if you could tell me uh, where you were in 1937, what you were doing that, that year. I lived in Glendale. California. <clears throat> I take it back. I lived in Hollywood, Los Feliz, and Vermont. Uh, I moved to Glendale the following year. 
I was working uh, full time as an English editor of a daily newspaper called the Ralph Rushimpo, still being published here in Los Angeles after 90 years. But uh, uh, I had um, received a degree from UCLA in political science and had gone to work in my senior year for the Ralph Rushimpo. So well, one of the things we're looking at in this film is um, the economic climate mm -hmm. in, in the end of the decade there, mm. 37 and 38, and there were a lot of reports that everything was getting yes. better and the depression was over, and I wonder if you right. can tell me what, what it was like for you at that point. Were things getting better economically for you? Um, <clears throat> I always thought that every new job that I had, I improved my condition. While in school I worked uh, 12 hours on Saturdays at the Hollymont Market for $3 a Saturday. And uh, <clears throat> the job at the Rafashimpo paid me, I think, $65 a month, plus three meals in the commissary, you know, of the newspaper. And um, as I look back, it never occurred to me that it was, you know, hard times. It was enough to eat. We had a roof over our head, paid our rent, and I took the streetcar down to the, the job every day, and I enjoyed it. Did you see a lot of hardship around you still, or? Yes, yes I did. I saw people on the street corners selling apples. I read about it in the newspaper that we were in a deep depression, that there was uh, unemployment, I think about that time they talked about a bonus march to Washington, D.C. And you couldn't work for a daily newspaper reporting what was happening in the city, even though this was an ethnic newspaper, without being aware of the fact that there was a worldwide depression. Times were hard. Uh, the government in Washington, D.C. had started out by declaring a bank holiday. and. Uh, we knew that times were hard. Uh, I think uh, while the <coughs> wage scale was such, I think I remember at that time we quoted the fact that if you were a manager of a Safeway store and earned uh, enough to support a family of four, two children, a couple, and if you got $125 a month, that was going scale. Uh, the dollar was worth a great deal more in those days, and so he didn't get as many of them. But uh, we were in a depression. And what little economics I'd studied at UCLA, uh, I had learned that in the early days, in the 19th century, we didn't call it a depression, we called it a panic. And then in the uh, 1930s, newspapers picked up the term depression, and that's what we were suffering. I wonder if you can help me understand a little bit what kind of opportunities there were for Japanese Americans. Can you um, <coughs> a little bit about some of the yes. obstacles that you talked well, about? Well, it was a standing, uh, wasn't a joke, it was kind of ironic, but the most successful entrepreneur among the Japanese Americans, I think one of the more successful in the Los Angeles area was a man named Susumu Hasuike, H-A-S-U-I-K-E. Japan born, but he had had the uh, drive to uh, not only own one fruit and vegetables uh, store, but he had a chain of them. I don't remember how many he had at its peak, but it ran into several dozen. And it was said that if you got an engineering degree at UC Berkeley, you, they weren't handing out those degrees at UCLA, uh, you could get a job polishing apples and stacking potatoes for three-star produce, that it wasn't unusual to go to um, a uh, fruit stand and discover that degree. In my own case, I was uh, offered a uh, scholarship to the University of Missouri in journalism, <clears throat> but it was just for uh, the tuition. It didn't cover the, the um, cost of living, so I chose to go where I could, you know, work and earn a salary. Uh, I think the uh, uh, 
jobs were relatively limited for uh, people of Japanese descent in those days, as they were for other ethnic groups who belonged to so-called minorities. So was California a very receptive uh, community for Japanese Americans? Well, we were born here, or most of us were. So <clears throat> I think that California had a long history of anti-Oriental political agitation. The uh, organized labor, you know, first because when the Chinese were brought in to build the railroads, I think successive waves of Asian immigrants all ran into the same thing, same thing that Southern Europeans ran into in New York and, and on the East Coast. I'm going to have to interrupt you, and I want to pick mm -hmm. up that story where we were <coughs> run out on this roll. Oh, sure. So I told you it might be a little <laughs> right. short this one. All right. Get you five yeah. minutes to warm up, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, give you a full ten-minute roll. One second. Speeding. Work. We were talking, you were in the middle of telling me about uh, the situation in California for Japanese Americans and whether you felt yes. welcomed here. I think uh, during my uh, student days at UCLA. Uh, Let's hold for a second. Yes. Helicopter. Oh, your helicopter. Oh, Okay, let's uh, uh, yes. start where we, All right. we were Fine. before about mm -hmm. California and whether or not it felt yes. like a receptive place, like a home to you. I, uh, if you lived in California in the 1920s, so I've lived here since 1916, so, but uh, you knew that you were not really a first-class citizen on an equal footing with other, you know, classmates. Um, one, it wasn't just the economic uh, difference. I think it was more a question of knowing that uh, customs that were, you know, cast in concrete here. I remember the uh, first time I walked down here into Westwood Village to get a haircut. I was a sophomore at that time, and uh, I was told that your hair is different, so go to <laughs> Little Tokyo. Uh, that, that was not an uncommon experience. See. If you went into uh, good restaurants, couldn't afford them anyway, but uh, you know, uh, you usually might be seated in the back. Now, this might not have been that common an experience, but I think it was in that for most people who were visibly different, you know, if you were black, we didn't say black in those days. You were a Negro, or the, there was other, thing, or a Japanese or Chinese. There weren't many other Asians, but I think the Japanese and Chinese bore the brunt of the early anti-Oriental, you know, feelings just generally. I think most noticeably, and I ran into this on graduation from UCLA, and uh, attempting to buy a home, and you discover that within the legal framework of how you buy a home, there was a thing called, um, uh, I think it was a deed which said uh, occupancy of this property can be only by a person of Caucasian descent, which eliminated a lot of us. So I think in those ways, later as I became an English editor of the Rafa Shimpo and discovered that literally in Little Tokyo, I had never lived in a segregated racial community until I began to work for the newspaper. My parents had always lived in, you know, we had the worst house in a Caucasian neighborhood, you see. Or uh, they, uh, my exposure was to customers of my parents' fruit stand. And the, in the course of the day, if I talked to a hundred people or waited on them, and often I did more than that, there might, uh, there probably would be not a single Japanese person but um, uh, the discovery that in a way we were hemmed in in a ghetto because there's so many laws and rules that said you cannot do this and you cannot do you cannot be licensed as a lawyer or as a doctor uh, or as an accountant or in, in the professions because there were uh, restrictions based upon your race and that was pretty much um, typical 
Um, I think it was accepted by the first generation Japanese, but not so by the second. Did that affect the way you, um, the way you felt about uh, your citizenship here? Did you feel at home here? Did your parents feel at home here? My but parents I mean, never did feel at home. I think my mother did. <clears throat> she accommodated whatever had happened. And she was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't think she was baptized, but she accepted Christianity and, and sent her children to Christian Sunday school. My father, uh, who uh, took refuge as a Confucian scholar and background of Buddhism, simply said that this was a white man's country. There's no place for me. If he had ever been successful in business or otherwise, he probably would have taken us all back to Japan. But he was not a businessman, and so he could never afford to. So he's really put up with it. How did you feel? You were in the last <coughs> oh, How did you feel about I, your, uh, your place in this country? Well, you know, uh, I had very dear and good friends at school. Uh, one friend I lost this past year. We have known each other since we were in the third grade at Los Feliz Elementary School. That's a long time. And uh, I, I would say most of my friends, all of my friends in the school days were not Japanese. I feel very much at home. It's very much part of it. And um, I think in 1923, when Japan had that very severe earthquake, and my father had <coughs> brought me up to believe that you, <coughs> you could never get a square deal in dealing with anybody who was not Japanese. But I remember taking a shopping bag and walking all over Hollywood, collecting donations from people to help <coughs> people who were made destitute by that earthquake, and uh, brought back a lot of money, a bag full of <laughs> coins and bills. And I began to question my father. If they're all that bad, how come? <laughs> you know? He <clears throat> began to feel that uh, much of what he was saying applied to him, but not necessarily to his children. So was there a sense mm -hmm. of uh, dual allegiances at all on your part? Oh, I think so, yes, very much so. That, uh, that? Well, you know, uh, uh, it, I think it was kind of funny when I, I read a great deal. I went to the library constantly, and um, I remember one year we were to, um, he's, you know, the idea of putting a bookmark with your name on it. And uh, I think my father's influence showed because I looked at some of those early bookmarks and I had carved a Japanese sword and then my name, and I put that in a book. And I thought that was kind of, as I look back on it in later years, that was kind of funny, but it, it certainly indicated that my father came from what they call a samurai family in Japan. He was very proud of that. And uh, I, uh, I know one of the greatest disappointments uh, that he expressed to my wife was that when he was uh, getting older, he asked me would I like uh, his collection of swords uh, or his books, and I made the comment, what would I do with the sword, cut cheese with it? I mean, you know, he thought, that to him was blasphemy. He left me his books, and he left my wife his swords. <laughs> but the books, <laughs> I can't read them, <laughs> so I gifted them to the UCLA or you know, Asian American Study Center, or to, uh, I think some went to the Japanese American Museum. I wish I had learned to read Japanese. I, I never did. Mm. We talked on the phone a little bit about the kind of uncertain citizenship mm. status that existed among Japanese Americans. Yeah. I wonder if you can, can help me understand yeah. that and, and how it affected your family. Well, <clears throat> I was typical, I think, of those who, um, when I was born, I believe my father, I was born at home in Portland, Oregon, and my father, a year or two later, I think, registered me as a uh, Japanese subject. They, they did that in Japan. So I was, uh, uh, I, but I, by virtue of having been born in the United States, I was an American citizen. And uh, at the outbreak of, or before the outbreak of war, 
we were made conscious of the fact that um, if you had dual citizenship, you were subject to the laws. If I were in Japan, I'd have to serve in the Japanese army. In this country, I'd be eligible for the draft. And uh, that was my situation when, be just before Pearl Harbor, uh, when my wife and I married, uh, I re renounced Japanese citizenship. Part of it was due because of my boss, the publisher of the Ralph Shimpo, had believed strongly himself that if we were going to live here, we should be citizens of the United States. Now, he couldn't become one because the laws forbid that. But, but there was that um, dual loyalty fear uh, in much of the uh, public in California. Mm -hmm. I think that may account for the behavior of Japanese Americans during World War II. They were out to prove that they belonged here. So. Uh, talk to me about what happened uh, to you um, during Pearl Harbor. Start, start, if you could, by telling me where you were when you heard and what happened to you. Oh, I was home in Glendale, <clears throat> yeah, and it was Sunday, and I had this call from my friend uh, who was on the staff of the Los Angeles Examiner, Magner White, and he called and said, uh, the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor. And so my immediate reaction was, well, I'll have to go down to the newspaper and put out an extra, which I did. And um, I think um, uh, the, uh, I, I can't, uh, my mind is fuzzy, and I, the entry in my red books don't show it, but I thought um, uh, during that hectic day, we, um, we worked on putting out, uh, the calls were coming in everywhere, from everywhere, and I believe it was on that day that... I think maybe we should oh, yes. stop because mm -hmm. it's time to change camera rolls. Oh, all right, fine, first. okay. <laughs> And you know what I might do is uh, when we get in the next roll, mm -hmm. I, uh, before we get to Pearl Harbor, I, I meant to ask you about your That's, uh, and the roll out on camera roll 100. Um, I want to talk about your awareness of what was going on in Japan, and perhaps you could tell me about your your job at the newspaper and, and what that was and how you became aware of what was going on? The uh, English section staff was very small at the time. Uh, Louise Suski, who had been editor for many years, she was the first editor, was um, uh, the person with whom I worked. They, they had another bilingual editor named George Nakamoto who had thought he had greater opportunities in Japan and he left, so I took his place. and. Um, uh, the first uh, responsibility that Mr. Komai, the publisher, uh, gave me was he said, you work with the Japanese section editor who does the front page. See? And I said, well, I don't, you know, read or speak Japanese very well. He said, well, you understand enough so that my, uh, every morning, I, I, my job was to take the either Rengo or Densu shortwave wireless dispatches that came in from Tokyo every morning. And there it was in English, Japanese written in English, called Romaji. And uh, Mr. Shimozma would read that to me, and it wouldn't it'd be like Greek or Latin. Uh, and uh, then he would explain to me what it meant, and I would be taking notes, and I would each morning uh, write in English the uh, article that appeared in the paper. I did six years of that and got to be fairly good and I became conversant with the sound of Japanese words. And uh, as this, I... I'm sorry, I was, mm -hmm. was going to say, what did this do for your awareness? Of well, what, what that did was that, you know, I was reporting about the Japanese um, invasion uh, in China. The uh, I guess, uh, the occupation of Manchuria, the military, you know, influence in the Japanese government, and uh, reporting that. Uh, at the same time, reporting on the impact of that in the United States, you know, the um, sinking of the gunboat Panay on the Yangtze River, 
there are many incidents that uh, made me aware that the thing that was happening was growing hostility, uh, the clash of interests between the United States and Japan. And that uh, made me realize that one day, and I, I'd taken, I think, I, uh, in my major in political science, I think if you go back to the 1930s, one of the lectures, there was a professor, Charles Titus, who had been in, I think, in military or army intelligence, and he lectured on what he called the Columbian picture, a theory developed by professors at the University, Columbia University on why eventually Japan and the United States would fight a war on the Pacific. And uh, I think I also mentioned my reading of a book that I have read many times over by Homer Lee, The Valor of Ignorance, pointed out how these two forces would meet and fight a battle of war in the Pacific. He also predicted that Japan would lose. Uh, he didn't go further on to say what they would do in the economic sphere following the war. But that was uh, something that uh, I lived with every day, uh, being with the Japanese language newspaper. And incidentally, the Rap Shinpo still is being published as the largest you know, Japanese language newspaper in the United States. Mm -hmm. So you were, what kind mm -hmm. of articles were you writing to this effect? Well, um, as I look back on it, I was writing propaganda, uh, apologizing for what Japan was doing. And that, that was, you know, considered the role that if you were uh, a Japanese American with a sensitivity about the need for what you're doing for your own people, in quotes, then uh, you were defensive about, and you wanted to explain all the good things that were coming out of what Japan was doing in uh, East Asia. Tell me uh, how this, this growing concern about the inevitability of war between Japan and the United States um, made you feel uh, that, that Well, <clears throat> we were being attacked in the mainstream media the Hearst newspapers, with people who were, you know, writing about the yellow peril, the threat to uh, the safety of the republic, you know, with uh, the <coughs> people who were multiplying like rabbits on the west coast, the Japanese. Uh, we were not Japanese Americans, we just simply were Japanese. And the, the um, I think the tone of, uh, the Los Angeles Times, which today is regarded as middle of the road or even left of center on many issues, um, it, uh, felt that there were really may or may not have been a place for the descendants of the Japanese immigrants. Uh, I think they felt the same way about the Chinese. Uh, the, the, uh, you had the native sons and daughters of the Golden West, the American Legion, uh, some uh, the the Grange. These were uh, organizations of groups of people who really owned and ran cities and communities and areas up and down California. And uh, I think the their ability to, you know, influence the legislature to pass laws that restricted. Uh, the opportunities for people who are not of Caucasian descent. Uh, that was the order of the day. So what um, were you, you had told me you were afraid about what this might mean for Japanese Americans as war was building. Abroad. Well, the, the thing that we feared probably was that we would either be uh, incarcerated, put into camps, or deported. Well, we, we had, um, in the Congress of the United States, Senators from, say, Mississippi, I think it was a man named Stewart. There was another one uh, named Rankin. Stewart was from Tennessee. But people who I used to, you know, subscribe to and read the congressional record, and I remember <laughs> that, you know, uh, I think Senator Stewart quoted a very popular sports writer whom I uh, read faithfully, uh, except when he wrote about anti -ch He was named Henry McLemore. And he says, you know, by God, uh, the <laughs> once a chap, always a chap. And the, if, when a war comes, the only thing we can do is to round them all up, put them on an island in the Pacific, and sink the island. I mean, this was not an uncommon 
point of view. This made, you know, people who are living in these, uh, if, if they weren't physical ghettos, they were mental ghettos, people that, who felt that the walls around them were so high, it was hard to get over them. And that uh, most of us, you know, had been born and raised on the West Coast. We didn't know what the rest of the country was like. And as a consequence, I think there was a great deal of anxiety that, my God, what's going to happen if and when the war comes? And this may uh, count in my, as I look back in retrospect, the only vocal organization representing this beleaguered group was called the Japanese American Citizen League. And, you know, much of what this group and its leaders did at that time maybe was an overreaction to this fear that, my God, we, we don't have too many defenses and we haven't got too great a, a chance. I, I think this is what happened. You uh, <coughs> went back to Washington uh, at one point. When we were in, in October of 1941 two months before Pearl Harbor. If I could have predicted that, <laughs> I don't think I would have gone. But I had been <clears throat> for some time talking with my publisher. Uh, I had, I think in, in 1939 and 40, uh, created some real problems for the business office by, uh, in my, uh, I think, uh, eagerness to fight against discriminatory practices, I had picked up a quotation from a San Francisco publication called The Newsletter and Wasp. And I quoted them because at that time there was a drive on to deprive Japanese fishermen in this Terminal Island area of their right to run those, to earn a livelihood. They were going to uh, pass laws that would restrict them. And uh, I picked up a quotation from the newsletter in WASP in San Francisco and ran it without permission. And we got sued by that paper, $1,500. Now, for someone earning $65 a month, that's a fortune. And I thought he was going to fire me. Instead, he sent me to a lawyer that represented the newspaper, a man named Marcus Roberts, and said, uh, he's going to lecture to you on what you should do that um, out of ignorance you've done these things. It's going to cost the publisher, you know, more than a year's salary for you. I said, well, if he's going to fire me, I guess I'll go back to work in a fruit stand. He um, didn't fire me. He told me to go and study law, you see. I didn't know where I could find the time. I was, I was holding another job beside the newspaper because I wanted to earn some more money. But I went down to the University of Southern California Library and began reading things. Eventually, I uh, took a correspondence course from LaSalle Extension University in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But in the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in my reading, no, that's all right. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, does that uh, yeah. bother you? Yeah. Okay. Is your machine on? Yeah. It, well, it, it'll, uh, yeah, it, it'll go, uh, it, it'll go yeah. off shortly. It, it, I think it rings three and a half time. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, I can take it off the hook. Would that be better? Let's uh, roll out on camera roll 318-101. So if you can just start by telling me about what you did in October of 1941. Well, in uh, October, I had suggested to Mr. Komai, the publisher, that in the reading he had had me do in the Law Library. Stop Okay, marker. Mark. Okay, can you tell me about your trip to work? Y yes. Um, the, uh, wh when I had uh, reported to Mr. Komai that during World War I, German-language newspapers owned by, in quotes, enemy aliens were allowed to publish under what was called the Espionage Act of 1917, and uh, expressed to him the opinion that perhaps that might apply to us if and when war came. Uh, he arranged with the Central Japanese Association, which was an organization of first-generation Japanese, to have its president, a man named Nakamura, go to Washington, and I would go with him. And uh, 
Mr. Nakamura would take care of Central Japanese Association business, and I would see Mr. Francis Biddle, the Attorney General, and ask him if he could then grant to the Rafa Shimpo the permission to publish. And uh, I did, I flew in, it was about two months before Pearl Harbor to Washington, D.C. First time I really had been out of Los Angeles County, I think, uh, since I had moved here as an infant. And I saw Mr. Biddle, and I also then took that occasion to interview and visit about 80 members of the Senate and Congress and the House of Representatives, beginning with the California delegation, and wrote articles for the RAFU about it. And uh, in, the, in that experience, I discovered that, you know, I was ordered by the War Department to appear the day after my visit with Mr. Biddle to uh, go to the munitions building of the War Department. And I was interviewed and interrogated for a good part of the day by a man named Colonel Sumter Bratton, head of G2, which was intelligence of the Army, and his assistant, Major Wallace Moore. And at that time, I discovered for the first time, to my surprise, that the uh, Army had a complete set of the Rafa Shimpo, all the editorials that I had ever written in the six years that I was an English editor. And they also had things in the Japanese section. And I was questioned as to whether or not uh, I had written for both sections because they were in contradiction to one another. One waved the American flag, they said, the other waved the Japanese flag, and that they were, you know, he, they made it quite plain that it looked rather suspicious. Uh, it was, for me, a learning experience, of course. They, they were really questioning <coughs> your allegiance at that point, I guess. Well, yes. H how do you say that, you know, for the greater glory of the Emperor of Japan and the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, that um, the Japanese are like big brothers to the Chinese. They're going to teach them, you know, not only manners, but to, to be civilized. Did, you make, did that mm -hmm. whole experience make you feel quite vulnerable at that point? Well, yeah, it shook me up. wonder what in the world. And then at that point, I realized how inadequate I had been because I didn't understand Japanese. I didn't read it and I didn't write it. And I'm, I was certain in my own mind they don't believe a word that I said when I said I don't know what's going on there. That, uh, Tell me about uh, um, Pearl Harbor now. What, what happened? Well, on years? Pearl Harbor, after I had been notified by a friend at the Los Angeles Examiner that the Japanese were and had bombed Pearl Harbor, I drove down to the newspaper. By then, I had come into an automobile and didn't have to take a train or a streetcar. And I spent the day there. Uh, on that day, we were answering inquiries. And I, I, I'm jotted down that, you know, a man named Damon Runyon came in to interview um, me about uh, what, uh, he wanted to know how I felt and, and uh, what was, when I said, what do you think is going to happen to us? He said, well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but um, I, he wrote a column about Little Tokyo on, on that day. and. Um, I remember uh, being approached by two gentlemen from the Federal Bureau of Investigation who uh, said they had a presidential warrant for my arrest and I must come along with them. So I didn't have time to say, you know, we had uh, five or six staff people too there. As well, I want to call my lawyer. No, no time for that. I want to call my wife. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd call Marcus Roberts and uh, I couldn't call and just come along. So I was taken to the central jail and booked. And uh, they fingerprinted me, took my picture, took all of my things, and I was put into a cell with, uh, there was a young Mexican who um, said, what are you in here for? And he said he was, had been uh, taking and selling drugs. But he, he carved a little uh, crucifix out of a toothbrush handle and gave it to me. I carried that for years. The other man <laughs> was, I think, 
He said he was a German, but I think he was a, or a Russian. And I said, why are you in here? And he says, well, there's this Jewish you know, restaurant I've been going to for years, and every time I go in, I've been saying Heil Hitler. <laughs> and so he was in there. These were my cellmates for my first night in so jail. So how long were you there? Did they ever let you call your wife? Uh, no, no, they didn't. They moved me on the third or fourth day to Lincoln Heights. All of my friends, the Japanese American, they're all first generation Japanese. I knew them all. Uh, they moved uh, us around, and I was taken to Lincoln Heights, and then from there moved to county jail on top of the Hall of Justice. I was in for 11 days and nights. My wife thought I was dead. Or, you know, there was a doctor from Gardena, I think his name was Honda, or Honda, and he committed suicide in there. He, uh, he had been accused of being the head of the Japanese Veterans Association. He died uh, in there, but uh, they just released me. I think they, one reason I have a fetish about keeping you know, a diary all these years is that the FBI got a hold of my diary then. And of course, I, I went everywhere as a, a uh, uh, I, what is it, uh, as a reporter and an editor. Mm -hmm. I, I know being, when I was interrogated on my way by the two agents, they said, well, what are you, you know, uh, arresting me for? And he said, well, you've been there to see Attorney General Biddle, you've been in the White House to see Mrs. Roosevelt, you've been all these congressmen, and your movements are so suspicious, you know, and I said, well, I'm a newspaper man, you see. But uh, they told me uh, that's uh, the reason for, you know, I'm held on suspicion. Years later, under the Freedom of Information Act, I, I was a member of the Black Dragon Society, I was a member of the Communist Party, I was an agent for the Imperial Japanese government, and furthermore, they didn't believe that my name was my own, see, because Togo was the name of a Japanese admiral who had sunk the Russian fleet in a battle during the Russo-Japanese so War. So were you feeling rather desperate to, that for those 11 days, or angry, or...? Well, one, I was worried about my wife, and she was pregnant. She was nine months pregnant. But uh, you, you make the best of it, and I prayed a great deal. And this young man gave me, a, this drug addict gave me a crucifix. <laughs> and I wasn't even properly churched. I had been married in an Episcopal service, but I'd never been baptized. So I... Well, Tell yeah. me about, you, you then went to the camps, and I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about what the climate was like there, what, what the attitude among the people inside the camps was towards America. I think people tended to accommodate, you know. They uh, simply uh, made the best of what they could. And uh, I think uh, the older generation said, well, you know, it's got whatever has happened, it's well, make I guess the best I'm, of I'm it. I'm wondering about when we, were on the, <clears throat> we talked on the phone, you mentioned there was sort of mm -hmm. a a bitterness about the way you were, you, you not a bitterness, but it... Uh... I think it was a bitterness. We were mad. Uh, I, I must have found an outlet for it by writing to people that I had known. There was one gentleman who later became, he ran for governor of California, Robert Walker Kenny. He became attorney general when Earl Warren was governor. And I had met Bob Kenny when he was a reporter, later became a Superior Court judge, and he was a great teacher about, you know, politics. And uh, I corresponded with him, and I said, you know, I don't understand. I'm now an enemy alien, 3C. Yeah, or, or, yeah, that's what it was. In 1944, when I was now out and a volunteer worker for the American Friends Service Committee, helping to bring people out of, you know, Auschwitz and Belsen and the European death camps and finding jobs for them in Chicago, he wrote me and said, I'm coming to Chicago for the Democratic National Convention. And he was a Henry Wallace delegate. Mm, yeah, so he, he invited me to the Palmer House and we had lunch. Now, I could only go to a YMCA and, <laughs> and treat him. <laughs> and he said, I finally found out that you're never, you know, I, you still think you're going to be uh, taken into either uh, naval intelligence or into the army. He says, forget it, see. Uh, you, you'll never make it. And I said, why? And he said, well, simple. You've got people on your draft board who say that you are a figment of some Japanese <laughs> spy masters that you've been planted in this country. And that's why, uh, you know, I said, well, I don't even read or write Japanese. Well, that's why they, they, you fit the need for, you know, them to find someone who will
Oh, John Malkovich. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so good. Yeah, he was. Okay, we're rolling now. Um, tell me about the migrants and what you knew about the Okies and Arkies who were coming to California. Well, I, I learned secondhand about the overall problem in California from a man named Kerry McWilliams, who uh, was a wonderful teacher. He had become, I think, under uh, Governor Olson, a Democratic governor, had chief of housing and immigration, immigration re referring to, you know, Oklahoma migrants who were coming here. And uh, I shared with him the feeling that the uh, arrogance of the established people who were well off in California in trying to exclude these people was no different from the uh, racial bigotry that victimized people who were not, you know, within the majority group. And so not only was I empathetic or sympathetic to their plight, but wondered what in the world uh, people could do in any way to help. And uh, later on uh, in my Chicago years, I had the chance to become an editor of the American School News, which was a correspondence publication. And I met many, many people from Oklahoma in that. And I found that, you know, uh, I had always felt deprived because of my race. And yet I had the ability now to help, you know, thousands. Actually, there are several hundred thousand of these students around the world, but in the United States, who were deprived of a decent education. And so I felt that it was an interesting topsy-turvy kind of world where you had an opportunity to use what you had to help others. And I think the plight of the Okies, uh, you know, we, uh, the chief of police of Los Angeles had uh, patrols at the border to turn these people back or in every way. That, um, and so, you know, when I mentioned the, uh, John Steinbeck's book and the movie that was made of it, I think that helped to enlighten people about uh, the 30s and what uh, the economic plight. And we, you're, there are examples of that today because we have the same kind of problems on a bigger scale. Um, you uh, uh, went to the fair, I know, and I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about what it felt like that was all about to you. My recollection is, uh, like everybody else, uh, somebody said Sally Rand might be there from Chicago. <laughs> no, I, I uh, well, I, that was my first World's Fair in uh, Treasure Island, San Francisco. And um, uh, I was impressed by uh, the foreign exhibits, but it was nothing like subsequent fairs that I had been to. But I think it was uh, California's effort to begin to dig itself out of the economic depression. And uh, that kind of attempt, you see it even today, you hope that it succeeds. Uh, I wanted to, to go back and just ask you again about um, the Panay. If you can describe for me again the, how you felt the night you heard about that and how you heard about it. Well, uh, I think my first reaction was one of disbelief, that it was a flagrant, you know, uh, demonstration of the uh, what the Japanese military were intending to do. I think they were flaunting and looking for, you know, some reason. But uh, I uh, went uh, dutifully to uh, try to give the Japanese version of uh, of why it uh, it happened. The, the meddling um, by the United States that if you get into a war zone, you might get shot or you might get sunk. And uh, I think it was the uh, cries for boycott of Japanese goods and uh, the anti-Japanese feelings that that engendered, you know, just generally in California and in Southern California, uh, I think spread a feeling of uneasiness among uh, people who were Japanese American readers of our newspaper. Um, I want to ask you to, to kind of reflect now mm -hmm. on, on these years. We've talked, uh, we've talked a lot about some of the um, citizenship rights issues, and, mm -hmm. and I wonder when you look back on them, 
How do you how do you think those years shaped you or, or your attitude about um, this country? I think we've, uh, with all of the things that people say may be wrong with this, you know, my wife and I have visited, by last count, 43 countries around the world. But since then, we've been um, we've been all over the world. We've met people. We visit with them in their homes. We uh, love to travel. Um, with all the things that are wrong, uh, I think that, the, you know, we talk about the goals in our Constitution and Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, and these are, there's nothing static about them. And the fact that we have not been able to, you know, fulfill uh, those goals. Uh, it's I, uh, each time we come home to this is home. Whatever uh, is wrong with it, we prefer to be here to any other place in the world. And uh, we have, I think, a lot of friends who feel exactly that way. You mentioned the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Do you think all of those those kinds of rights were something was something that was being tested and pushed and explored during the 1930s? Always has been and may still be. Can you talk uh, to me about that? Well, <clears throat> the, um, I, I served on the board for a few years of an organization here called the Constitutional Rights Foundation, and we observed the bicentennial of it, I think, last year. I no longer am on that board. And in, you know, for about 45 years I've been a uh, recipient of the Lincoln Foundation's mm -hmm. publications, and a few years ago, after you know we had been enraged for all these years about what had happened to us and the violation of our civil rights, I learned that the great emancipator suspended the Bill of Rights in order that the Union could survive. Mm -hmm. We, and uh, if it's a question of survival, what choice do we have? The fact that we happen to be on the wrong end of the thing <laughs> made us, you know, uh, victims. But had we been sitting where the people who had to make those hard decisions were, we might have done the same thing. But uh, ultimately, um, I think uh, justice does prevail. And uh, one of the other things I think that kind of went on during that mm -hmm. period were uh, there was a reexamination of the rights of poor people and how to what our mm -hmm. attitudes towards the poor were. And I, I wonder if you've given any thought to that when you think about the Yopis or the Nikes. Well, when uh, <clears throat> I had the privilege of working for the and with the American Friends Service Committee in Chicago for, I guess it was 1943, four, uh, up to five, so about two and a half years. Every morning, see, I, I'm, I was not a <laughs> I'd never <laughs> been a I couldn't be a Quaker because I didn't feel I was good enough to uh, ad adopt their principles. But every morning, you know, they, we'd hold hands in a circle, the whole staff would be, and um, they would pray in their fashion, whatever came to mind, you see. And um, they defined it as, you know, not living by the teachings of Jesus, that, you know, the lack of concern for those less fortunate which uh, typified the attitude of so many people when they talked about the homeless, the poor, and the Okies. And then I remember we were rescued in the very depths of the worst uh, experience we had when we didn't know whether we were going to have to go back where they wanted to kill us or how, or were they going to deport us to Japan. The Quakers came along and made it possible for us to get over that and come to Chicago. And um, they were the first people who were welcomed on both sides of the battle zone. So we, uh, and we look back and uh, members of various Christian church groups did a great deal to salvage and to save, you know, us. Uh, why shouldn't we do the same for others? Now, I think this is one of the lessons that we learned out of our evacuation experience. You talked to me a little bit about um, certain values that you thought you developed during the Depression years. What did you what were the well, you die very hard. <laughs> you don't you don't give up, and that uh, whatever the obstacles may be, 
um, you do not lose faith. And, uh, you know, I choose to uh, try to take the positive reaction to whatever may happen. But, uh, that's interesting. You think that's something you mm -hmm. learned through mm -hmm. living through the, the 30s? And uh, the, the I the think 30s. so. If um, You know you're going to go eventually, but you want to delay it as long as possible. But uh, if you've been close to it, uh, you, you get a sense of values that, uh, and I think uh, it begins with family. We, we just celebrated our 52nd anniversary in, in uh, Honolulu That's last great. last month. That's so, great. Yeah. But, uh, okay, I think we can cut. It's fine. We're just about out. Well, so you're, you're a free yeah. man now. Thank well, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is um, room tone in the Togo Tanaka residence. Okay, quiet please.